Uh, very good evening to one and all. Welcome to Buddhist Ma Viara's uh, Facebook page. Uh, we are live today, and today we have a very special guest from uh, US, from Detroit, United States. He's uh, Bante Kusala. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, let me wish all our mothers who are following us today on uh, our Facebook uh, broadcast a very happy Mother's Day and hope you had a very pleasant uh, day with your children and your family. And um, in um, Detroit today, they're actually celebrating uh, Vesak on a, in a big way because uh, Vesak is uh, not a public holiday in America. So today, uh, we are very lucky to have Bante Kusala, even though uh, they are very uh, busy, because they've got a whole day full of programs uh, at uh, Detroit, at the temple in Detroit. So now I'd like to bring on Bante Kusala from uh, Detroit uh, for our evening Dhamma sharing. A uh, very good evening, Bante. How are you? Good evening, Leslie. Uh, I'm I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. We are good. We are recovering from our Visak celebrations, and for you, it's uh, just a start of your celebrations uh, at uh, Great Lakes in Michigan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Parallel to this, they are starting the program just behind me. I see. Okay. So there's two programs running simultaneously. <laughs> from yes. the so you are you as busy as uh, we are here in Buddhist Mahavira, or then? <laughs> and <laughs> that's for for good reasons. Yes. Yeah, that's for good reasons. That's true. That's true. Okay. Uh, before we get started, let me um, for many of you who do not know uh, much about Bante Kusala, uh, let me just quickly read out his profile so you have an understanding of where uh, Bante Kusala is from and uh, some background about himself. Uh, Bante Kusala, or rather, his full name is uh, Darangala Kusala Nyana. That's his full name. Uh, Bante D Kusala, is, which he is more famous by uh, by being using that name, by Bante D Kusala, was born in Sri Lanka in 1987. He entered the monastic uh, life at the age of 16 at uh, Ganga Giri Vihara in South Sri Lanka, uh, where in 2007 he received his higher ordination, Upa Sampada. Uh, he continued to pursue his undergraduate and graduate studies at the University of Peradeniya in Kandy, uh, Sri, Sri Lanka. He then moved to Italy to study cognitive science and engaged in mindfulness-based research at the University of Trento in Italy. In 2014, Mante moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts to pursue a Master's of Divinity degree from Harvard University as a Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation scholar. He had a scholarship from this family. Um, Bante Kusala has also uh, served as a translator for Bante uh, Vimla Ramsey, who we are all very familiar with, Venerable Sister Kema as well, Bante Ajahn Brahm Wanso, another very familiar Bante that we all very uh, known here in Malaysia, and uh, Ajahn Brahmali. Uh, he has lectured and taught internationally and served as a resident chaplain at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the second largest teaching hospital of Howard Medical School, and also at the Dana Faber uh, Cancer Institute from uh, 2017 to 2018. In 2018, uh, Bhante was invited to the Great Lakes Buddhist Vihara, just outside of Detroit, Michigan, to continue his Dharma service and volunteers in hospitals in the area as a spiritual care provider. Whilst at the uh, Great Lakes Buddhist Vihara, he's also working on his second year of the PhD in Pali from the Sri Jayawardenapura University of Sri Lanka. I would now like to hand um, the stage to Bhante Kusala to take us through uh, his Dhamma sharing, which was entitled, What is Enlightenment? So Bhante, would you like to share with us? Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction. I'm humbled that you took all that time to read so much. It took um, some time. Um, that's a little bit of the things I have been able to do. And um, without wasting much time, today the goal is to talk about enlightenment, a very um, unusual subject, but very timely. Uh, when it comes to the Vesak day, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, especially at a time 
like this when we are virtually meeting. It's hard to keep eye contact with people. Um, it's hard to um, kind of come closer and go deeper into subjects like this. But um, thankfully, we have ways to connect uh, virtually uh, with online media so we can open deep subjects like this. I'd like to begin with Ajahn Cha. You know, this is something I learned uh, being a translator to Ajahn Brahm. Um, one time when he did a retreat, Ajahn Brahm did a retreat in Sri Lanka in 2011, um, he mentioned about this. So somebody, a very, very wealthy uh, businessman, went to meet Ajahn Cha. He has been a patron, a supporter, um, you know, providing support, building material for um, the monastery, the what they are in uh, in Thailand. And this businessman, upon reaching Ajahn Chah, you know, said, you know, we have important, I have an important question, you know, two important questions to ask. You know, the first one is, um, they say you are good at meditating. And what do you do for meditation? You know, and then Ajahn Chah said, I eat, I sleep, you know, I walk, that's what I do. So this was a little strange response. And right up after that, the businessman asked, you know, they say you are enlightened. You know, are you truly enlightened? You know, the man thought he would, because he's, he has been a great supporter, he will get the good response. Well, he did get a good response. In his, res you know, Ajahn Chah's response, he said, I'm like a tree in the forest. You know, in this tree, there are sweet fruits, delicate, um, very juicy. In this tree, there are sour tasting and bitter tasting fruits. And birds come and enjoy the tree. For the tree, it's just a noise. The birds come and enjoy these fruits. But, you know, for the tree, it's just a noise. So when... When you hear something like that, I'm sure the businessman was not really happy because he was expecting an answer that's very straightforward. But when Ajahn Chah, you know, he's very smart with, with his presentation, when he said something like, like that, um, it was provocative, a thought provocative. We need to think. So, but Ajahn Chah's response, I think, brings us closer to the subject of enlightenment. You know, when somebody is enlightened, it's not something visible. It's not something invisible too. You know, you can tell from um, the behavior that this person, you know, whether he's a lay person or a monk, you know, there are questions around that, but whether he's a lay person or a monk, you can certainly think you know, it gives you the feeling that this this man must be enlightened. This man, you know, must mean something in his demeanor, in his way of presenting, talking, and all that. So, what is really enlightenment then? And as you have been listening to many monks uh, in the past, you know, you hear they're talking about Buddha, I saw Bhante Sankhicha came alive from Sri Lanka. He's the abbot of this place here in this monastery. And I saw Bhante uh, Pemaratana uh, from, from Pittsburgh. He came um, and he, he did a talk. And many of these monks um, are my friends as well and uh, some are teachers in their teacher position. They have done great presentations about describing what the Buddhahood is. And when they have uh, presented what the Buddha is, they basically talk about enlightenment. You know, it's, it's, it's a place that we all aspire to be. Um, and when we make a wish, we say, may you travel far in the path towards Nibbana. And when I made that wish, Mr. Leslie said, 
don't make it too far you know we want it sooner we want it you know come closer traveling far is the goal within this lifetime and reaching enlightenment basically is reaching to a pure state of mind all our life we have been looking for attachment we have never sometimes you know gotten any freedom from attachment so instead of looking for attachment if there is at some point you decide you are leaving the attachment you are moving away from attachment right at that moment you have really um, come to feel what freedom really is and you continue that pursuit looking for it with 100 percent dedication when you have continued that way when you have you know strive when you are striving hard to reach something as if you know it's it's the only thing that you, that you want in life um, slowly you are getting there but this has to be a little bit about you know striving and also much less about kind of wanting and craving so in other words when you have come to a place where you don't need anything you are just satisfied wherever you are that freedom that you are enjoying is quite similar to enlightenment now you find many teenagers and they're not happy where where they are you find many adults they're not happy where they are you know you find some monks they're not happy where they are when you find all these you know different forms and figures and individuals all trying to reach this goal they are not happy where they are when you find the buddha if he went to the forest or if he stayed in the monastery they are happy where they are if there is a huge noise coming out the buddha would find a quiet place and you know stay in the bliss of nibbana in the bliss of the enlightenment he has enjoyed so come to that so have we you know taken enlightenment as a place to go somewhere hidden in a star you know you find it as a place to go travel by a vehicle not really <clears throat> good luck on that you can never reach to enlightenment by walking or by using an airplane or making a rocket or anything like that it's not buried somewhere in the space this very enlightenment that we talk about is within us within this own body within the body you find within the mind the body conundrum within this relationship you find what enlightenment is and now, uh, let me begin by saying a few things, you know. Before enlightenment, they say you chop wood uh, and uh, continue collecting fire uh, and prepare the, prepare the you know, journey. Now, after enlightenment, you chop wood and continue going the journey. There is not much difference found before and after the person remains the same it's only a shift of your understanding and and a moment in your continuation that has now stopped you have found for on your own understanding that you have reached to the freedom from craving freedom from all wanting you know, before enlightenment you chop wood and carry water they say and after enlightenment you chop wood and carry water so chopping wood and carrying water is part of the journey preparing for the journey and after enlightenment you 
just continue to chop wood and carry water. You no, know, carrying water. And why do we chop wood? Why do we carry water? It's just the way when we have reached to a supreme place, you don't act so different. You are just, you know, it's just, it's just the same person, same individual. You don't fly, you don't levitate. It's just that shift of understanding that you reach to. And sometimes people act like they are enlightened, but they don't really go very far. That's why, you know, wise people say when you when you are enlightened don't say that you are enlightened when you are an arahant don't say that you are an arahant why because you'll have to stay proving that for the rest of your life you will have to prove that you are enlightened you are one of them um, for the rest of your life because the demand for you will increase because everybody wants to know how you are enlightened what your behavior is you know, some people followed the Buddha for seven years to find whether he is enlightened. So let me bring a popular example. Um, the Buddha, when he was uh, just after reaching enlightenment on his Vesak uh, experience, you know, he did his meditation and he stayed uh, seven weeks in contemplation after reaching enlightenment. <clears throat> After that, um, he was you know, walking, journeying, and you know, and then he met this Brahmin. This Brahmin is able to interpret footprints. And this Brahmin, as soon as he saw the footprints of the Buddha, he thought, wow, this is a special person. I must go find out who this person is. So he followed the footprints and then he found at the, uh, under the root of a tree, the Buddha was sitting <coughs> calmly um, and as if, you know, there was nothing going on. And upon reaching to the Buddha, this man, his name is called Drona. He asked, he's a Brahmin, you know. Brahmin is someone who is an elite person who himself could be a, a wandering man, very wise. Um, he may also forecast the future. You know, this Brahmin up, approached the Buddha and asked, you know, are you a god? Everybody would love to say, yes, I'm the son of a god. I'm the, I'm the god of um, this, you know, this, this origin and I'm the creator. But the Buddha said, nope, I'm not. Um, and then he asked some, uh, something like, are you a Brahma? You know, a divine creator? And the Buddha said, no, I'm not the divine creator. Somebody would even go and say, yes, I am the creator. But the Buddha did not say that. Who are you? Are you a human being? And then the Buddha said, I'm not a human being. This puzzled the Brahmin. This confused him. Who are you then? The Buddha said, Pundari kang yataha vaggu toyena no palipati. Brahman. I'm like a lotus sprung off of mud, off of muddy water. And the lotus is unsmeared by mud. When the lotus comes out of the pond, it just is so pure, so clean, and the more you know petals it opens more delicate fragranceful and beautiful they are so the buddha said i'm like a lotus sprung out of mud but mud is never close to me then i'm not smeared by mud so the mud here is lust hatred and delusion 
I am uns unsmeared by lust, hatred and delusion. Tasma buddhosmi brahmana. That is why, therefore, I am the Buddha, the awakened, enlightened one. So this was the answer he gave. And another time he said, Abhinyayang Abhinyata, what has to be known. No, Abhinyaya here is, Abhi refers to something profound, what has to be realized, Abhinyata. I have realized it. Bhavetabbancha Bhavita, what has to be developed, what has to be cultivated, Bhavita. I have developed it. I have developed, improved, cultivated my mind. Pahatabbang Pahinamme, what has to be abandoned, removed, let go of. Pahinamme, I have abandoned, removed, let go of. Tasma Buddhosmi Brahman, therefore, I can be called the Buddha. Therefore, I am the awakened one, the Arahant, the canker eradicated one. I am free from defilements. Therefore, I am the Buddha. So, um, slowly we came to the discussion of a Buddha. Uh, when we were talking about enlightenment, these two are inseparable. The Buddha said, you know, I'm not the only Buddha to be, there will be future Buddhas, there have been past Buddhas, and this is a unique quality of an enlightened being, to not own the place, the place that he very, with very many difficulties he reached. And for many kalpas, for many millions of years, he has been working hard to reach this goal. And in this last birth, in this last birth, about 2600 years ago, he was able to accomplish his goal. This is very much a hard goal to achieve and he accomplished it, uh, accomplished it and then he did this lion's roar, you know, telling the world that I have come to this place. And then he trained his 60 students and told them, Charata Vikave Charikam, travel far, monks. Bahujana Hitaya, for the benefit of the world. Bahujana Sukhaya, for the welfare of many people. Attaya Hitaya Sukhaya Deva Manusana, for the benefit, for the wel welfare of gods and humans. Ma Ekena Dve Agamitta. Go alone, don't go together. Because he wanted to reach to as many places as possible. They say the Bhikkhave Dhamma, monks preach the Dhamma, Adi Kalyana, that is Pio in the beginning, Madje Kalyana, Pio in the middle, Pariyosana Kalyana, Pio in the end. Satthang Sabhyanjanam Kevala Paripunna. You know, with meaning, with proper words and language, Kevala Paripunna, complete in the beginning, middle and end. So what is the path for enlightenment? It is this very eightfold path, which is complete from Sila, the morality, Samadhi, stillness and concentration and Prajna, wisdom. You cultivate the wisdom faculty all throughout this journey and then the journey ends with the knowledge that there is nothing more to be done. Nothing more to be done. With that knowledge, you end the journey. It's all a self-discovery that usually begins with the guidance of a teacher, with, you know, with the guidance of Kalyana Mitras, where your uh, friends who are virtuous, who are supporting you in this journey, and the association of wise people, which is why 
uh, talk series like these are very important. So these monks and the work that you do remind you of this goal every time. At a time of a pandemic, you, know, you see a lot of people die. You, you hear about death. And this is quite alarming. And can we even reach enlightenment at a time like that? I don't think we have to be negative on that. It's quite possible. Um, right where you are, just as you close your eyes, you are ready to reach enlightenment because you are free from at least one thing that bothers you. What is that one thing that bothers you? It is this eye, the two eyes. We always try to keep the stay open and start seeing things, watching the television. You know, sometimes when parents are wise, uh, they say, we will never use a television in our house because children will not talk to us. It's a profound something in that statement. When you are pretty much absorbed into the television, you cannot think about anything else. Your senses disappear. Your awareness about the environment disappear. When you are, it's just about parents and children. But again, if you are a person who is aspiring enlightenment, who's wanting to find this goal of enlightenment, you should definitely stop this entertainment through television, entertainment through placing your ear, entertainment through the trade, you know, running after fragrances, you know, that could be the food or anything, uh, entertainment through your skin, the body and the tongue and the mind. All these six when they have disappeared. How do they disappear? They disappear with the disappearance of the five hindrances. When they have disappeared, you are beginning to awaken the lotus within you. The lotus within you is a little bit, you know, coarse, and hard on the surface, you know, the surrounding, but when wisdom light comes, it slowly, slowly opens, slowly, beautifully opens, your heart opens. This opening brings you to layers of petal that are more delicate and beautiful. So you have now taken off the six layers seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical sensations and thinking. When these six layers have been taken off, you are basically free from your sense, you know, sense faculties. And that puts a heavy burden down. And the Buddha said, it's like getting freedom from a debt, getting freedom from being lost somewhere in a in a place that is you know hard to come out of being free from a wound being free from you know some punishment so when you are that free you know, just imagine the things that you were constantly busy with have now gone all you have is this mind to cultivate, the luminous mind. The luminous mind needs to be well guided towards betterment. Mind alone does not know how to, how to cultivate itself unless a human being is able to feed it the right way. And what else disappears is the five hindrances. It's like you are walking in the rain and now you have buried the five pieces of glasses because you don't want to you know, step on them. But now with the rain, with a lot of rain, maybe the soil above the five pieces of glass will be washed away and they will reappear and will be harmful. 
that is why we need to have an umbrella in the journey and in that umbrella um, you are protected from the shower that comes and the, the shower um, where you go along the journey and the pieces of glass you know let them come but you are not bothered let them show up but you are not you are mindful you're very mindful that is the umbrella you're very mindful that as soon as you see the sharp pieces of glass you know that you are not going to step on them that sharp awareness the attention to things not ignoring them will bring you peace bring you calmness not more ignorance because you are not ignoring the five pieces of glass what are those kama chanda you know chanda here is desiring wanting uh, willing for things and chasing after things you know that vyapada is anger you know always you know wanting things to be the the way you want um, and this causes you know, mental peace to disappear tinamidda sleepy nature maybe you have eaten too much you feel dull because you have eaten less if you have exercised too much or maybe you have had an exhausting day at the end of all these you have lost you know the balance of the body so you are feeling sleepy and you know restlessness you are restless because you have abhijja and dominas abhijja is greediness dominas is disappointment so you are restless you are not you know mindful you are not you know clear what you are doing sometimes you walk to some place but you don't know why you walk to the kitchen and then that kind of a it happens but when it happens constantly there is a problem and the other one is doubt you are not completely sure whether this is working and then you give it up when these five pieces of glass have disappeared you are able to now enter the peaceful layers of your lotus mind the jhanas jhanas you know bring you joy when you feel it in your body in your forehead in your face in your you know chest across the entire body even the fourth jhana for example is felt like a radiant uh, cloth a white cloth very transparent covering your body the first one feels like a moistured soap very cool and the second one feels like a lotus you know submerged in water the third one feels like a you know lake very still water coming in every direction but it's not overflowing so cooling why do you feel that cool that's because slowly you are being disappeared you are getting lost technically and you are not getting burned you are getting lost and the more you have gotten lost you stop blaming things even when a noise comes you don't take it as a problem you are not even attached to the silence you know you don't blame the noise it's usually not the noise bothering you it's you bothering the noise and now you find out who that noise is slowly you see a process you don't see a lasting permanent self when that has disappeared you will see some states slowly states like infinite space infinite consciousness nothingness neither perception nor non perception so look at focus on that 
last one neither perception nor non perception take that that as a perception too you see you perceive something and you don't perceive it it's neither something perceivable nor non perceivable it seems like there is something but then that disappears the moment you try to grab onto it it disappears a so subtle state of the mind this is the place that nobody has crossed before when the buddha went to alara kalama and uddaka ramaputta they taught him up to neither perception nor non perception even uddaka rama's the uh, son said my father went to a place of neither perception nor non perception and you may try that and stay there and the buddha you know, upon deep consideration he realized if anybody gets stuck in this subtle state they can stay forever just like it happened to alara kalam and uddakram they stay they went as far, as far as they could go disappearing 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 then they thought wow this is how far i can reach i can only reach to nothingness and neither perception nor non perception and there is no more to be done but the buddha he was very wise he thought wow this must also be a perception let me not get attached to this let me let this also disappear let my consciousness not hold on to this not be attached to this he thought every perception is impermanent when he saw that when he realized that he became a unique teacher he let go of that neither perception nor non perception he realized that he understood that he saw that this is a place where somebody can get stuck when he got free when his his consciousness did not stay attached to that there is nothing to perceive nothing being born there consciousness has nothing to hold on to when consciousness has nothing to be conscious on consciousness disappears you disappear this very disappearance has not been seen by anybody before at that moment all the continuation ends the blackout it's not even a blackout it's so subtle that you only come to know what that is after emerging from that experience because the conditions because you live your life span is still there the burden of living is still there in that you you have the nature of returning you have sharp mindfulness you can program to come back certainly when you come back you discover there's nothing more to be done you have reached the end and that end that termination the no more process experience the place to not go any further the knowledge that nothing more to be done this is what you call enlightenment so that that's very much you know a fast journey like from the you know start till now i have been giving you throwing you a lot of words um i'm sure some of you were able to follow some of you may have gotten stuck that's why we have a q and a session um i can go on um adding more to this no i was uh, i remember clearly uh when i was in west virginia under the guidance of uh, bante gunaratna uh, in bhavana society Uh, i was in meditation you know i i began kind of an exploration on my own because the following day i was told to give a vesak talk that was in 2016 when um, for that so that was working at the back of my head 
I really wanted to find out, you know, why the Buddha is so unique, you know, why is he outstanding from all other teachers? Because there were people who were able to reach, you know, higher stages of mind. You know, there were people like Alar Kalama who happened to be the teachers of the Bodhisattva. You know, and when the Bodhisattva reached to the teacher level of the multitude of people there, the groups there, why did he refuse being the teacher? He refused for some reason. What is that reason? I began thinking, why is the Buddha outstanding? He, he was not looking for fame. He was, was not looking for popularity. He was not looking for leadership. The questions that bothered him in all his life, that birth, decay, illness and death, these four things are coming like four rocks and there is no escape. Most of us postpone enlightenment until your children have been raised, until you have, you know, gotten the pension, until you have done working, until you get some savings. And at the end, you realize, oh, I have been consumed by aging. I don't have the sharpness anymore. But this is why the Bodhisattva was so unique. He realized, had he stayed in household life with a beautiful princess, enjoying the life of you know birth of a son, enjoying the luxuries of a, a prince, you know, and in his father's kingdom, he realized he will not reach to these, to, to the true aspiration of his life. Just like that, he was running away even when he was offered the teacher position. Exceptional that he could teach uh, infinite space to the followings, the, to the students under Al-Arakal, who were under Al-Arakal. But now that teacher position has been given to Bodhisattva. Even then he realized, I'm not still free from birth. I'm not still free from aging. I'm not still free from illness, I'm not still free from death. You know, my friend recently passed away in, uh, in Dubai. Um, you know, he was going to the hospital and he called me, Bhante, I want to go to Sri Lanka, I will uh, give up everything. He died from, uh, unfortunately, from COVID-19. Um, and he only had two days in that hospital. He had unfinished business. And now compare a person, you know, he's, he was very successful as, you know, aircraft engineer has, you know, achieved many things in his life, houses built, vehicles bought, and he has everything basically. And his son has got an education and his wife's stable. And he was a great yoga trainer, you know, great physical balance, but he died. And Buddha, on the other hand, had accomplished, as a Bodhisattva, has accomplished a lot. He was born with luxuries, but he was very wise to let go of all that, renounce all that, to make a decision in his mind that I don't need these things to be happy. My goals are different. And as soon as he made that decision, he was unstoppable. Nothing could stop him. Nobody could stop him, not his father, not the, you know, people that were sent to him by his father, not the cry of the horse that he was so dear to and attached to. Nothing could stop him. Not even Alar Kalama, not even Uddhaka Rama's son. Even the highest meditative states and putting himself in a position of a teacher could not be, could not stop him. So that search, that seeking, that, you know, thirst 
is what brought him to enlightenment, what brought him to seeing the true end. And what was left then, what was left was his body and the, you know, just the ordinary memories he, he gathered throughout living, but he knew that there's no more. And is this doable? Absolutely is within, you know, he, the Buddha himself said in Satipatthana Sutta that if you do it, evam bhaveya, if you do it this way, people do it in all kinds of ways, but if you do it this way, you are able to reach enlightenment from seven days to seven years time. Within, within that time frame, the enlightenment is possible. So for many years, many, many months, many, many days, people have been listening to talks, but because they have not made that one decision, they are burdened with things and they are still, you know, getting dulled with all the responsibilities, not seeing a freedom, not seeing a moment to be free. I hope this helps you to inspire you, to be inspired, to seek enlightenment before it is you know, too late. The Buddha said, Appama Dena Sampadeta, when he passed away in Kusinara on a Vesak day, he said, Appama Dena Sampadeta, you know, uh, strive hard, uh, heedfully make the journey stable and continue because continue collecting wholesomeness. What is wholesome actually is meditative experiences, collect those, not the material belongings. And when he said that, he really wanted people to know that why he came to this world was to teach that, teach this escape to people. And sometimes I will tell you one last thing um, in Nakula Mata, Nakula Pitu story, when Nakula Pitu was sick, uh, Nakula Mata went to him and said, you go and ask the Buddha, you know, I will not marry any other person after, after you passing away. I will not, you know, give up on my practice. My faith will be stronger. As soon as these things were told, Nakula Pitu got up from his illness. So what was really bothering him was the mental burden that his wife will marry somebody because he had so much attachment towards his wife that his wife will lose faith towards the Buddha and will have a different family life. Things like this happen for us too. Sometimes when somebody is sick out there in the hospital, lonely, that loneliness is a moment really to see, abandon things and be happy, be delighted. And it needs to be done now before you reach to the hospital. When you have abandoned wanting and desiring things, even the hospital is a safe haven to be. With that, I will conclude. It's been 50 so minutes and uh, uh, Mr. Leslie, are you there? Yes, Bhante, I'm here. Don't worry. I haven't left you yet. Uh, it was a really interesting talk, Bante. Uh, Thank you. I think real, for some, I think it's a little conceptual and difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, even me, I'm trying to grapple with some of the words that he used. And the first time I'm hearing those things about glass pieces and stuff. So it's it's a new concept for me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is one question, Bante. Uh, let me just post it onto the screen. Sure. Uh, Yeah, Bhante, can one fall asleep whilst meditating in a sitting position? I can't tell the difference between falling asleep or in deep meditation. Well, I have been there. It has happened to me. Um, and if you ask, you know, many monks, they all go through this experience. And how do we distinguish the difference between uh, falling asleep and uh, in deep meditation when you when you have come out that's the only time you may know uh, or sometimes you can ask from you know from the person next to you if you are snoring you are certainly in sleep and uh, other times when you are alone meditating 
if your defilements are less bothering you for quite some time after that meditation after you know even in three to four hours time you are feeling calm and peaceful there you have been in meditation in in that sleep or deep meditation state um, you may be able to find through mindfulness um, and when you have cultivated the mind sharply you can also program it you can tell your mind that you know let me come out of the meditation in one hour um, you may even have out of body experience so you may feel like you are in a, you know sometimes you are in a sitting position meditating but you feel like you are in a in a loose dream and in those states i think these are interesting experiences i would still put them as part of your uh, meditation experience because you entered that through meditation so no meditation is bad meditation because your goal was to cultivate your mind to bring your mind to a better place if you have reached to anything better than whoever you were minutes ago it has helped you so congratulations on uh, sleeping in meditation so sleep samadhi is okay samadhi just accept it but next time tell your mind that if you fall asleep if you just before falling asleep may i be awake alert and you know see it as a snake and avoid that path does that help anything else yeah there are there i think that question for sister sally uh, was answered by bante i think that's pretty interesting answer falling asleep and meditating hmm. <laughs> many of us fall asleep i think okay bante there's another question here bante is there a scripture that says waking first and second jhana states are like seeing nibbana or having a glimpse of nibbana is that true can you share with us that particular sutra um i i don't have the sutra off of my head um and i'm not even sure if um it's it's not referring to jhanas basically you can definitely say uh, jhanas are a glimpse but it does refer uh, to uh, spiritual attainments like sovan you know reaching a stream winner state and that is regarded you know that can be taken as a seeing a glimpse of nibbana but um it's it's seeing the discontinuation and seeing that wow this is doable this this whole thing that the buddha has taught seems to work that is uh, discovering a pathway to nibbana about the jhanas uh, I don't. I mean, I have read the jhanas. I I kind of have the the formula in my head, uh, but not. I'm I'm sure you know. You can say that the first jhana, for example, you are you know freeing freeing from thinking and examining thoughts, freeing from free from sensual desire. Um, you enter and abide in the first jhana uh, with you know joy and rapture, born from that seclusion. um but you are still not seeing nibbana in that state you are only seeing seclusion from sense desires and uh, seclusion from your five hindrances unwholesome states um i think it's an entry way not completely a glimpse to nibbana if you check anupada sutta for example it talks about the details of uh, these states how venerable sariputta attained each of these levels um and you will see uh, gradually there is a gradual progression you are certainly on the path uh, but you may not necessarily seeing a glimpse of nibbana at that moment if you continue further you certainly will right 
you know, there are two things like path and fruition. So if you are on the path, certainly uh, before you reach fruition on that path, you are almost getting closer and closer to seeing this glimpse. That's, that's my response to that question. Any more questions? Bhante, some practice samatha, some vipassana, etc. Do we need to do both or all methods or just one method to help us reach Nibbana? So this is a, a very many monks have responded to this question and I have responded as well. Samatha and vipassana, the Buddha has mentioned both terms in different, you know, in different places. But if you take Satipatthana Sutta, for example, um, you see just as Samatha grows, Vipassana also grows. You know, 22 times in Satipatthana Sutta, you find that the Buddha is talking about insight cultivation. If you read it carefully, that is your manual. I take it as my manual for my practice. And that 22 times, along with practicing Samatha, Buddha encourage you to see, see things as they arise. Why is that? That's because the two are inseparable. It's like the two sides of a coin. One side of this hand, Ajahn Brahm says, this palm exists because the other side exists. That's how you need to see in Samadha and Vipassana. Vipassana, for example, seeing things as impermanent as they arise and pass away. This will help you to stay in Samatha more. Being in tranquility will help you to see things that arise and pass away. So nobody can say I'm only doing Samatha. Nobody can say I'm only doing Vipassana. You can say I am doing Bhavana. I'm cultivating the mind. Somebody ask that question, are you doing Vipassana, are you doing Samatha? You can say, I'm doing Bhavana. Why? Because you don't want to just pick, you know, if you do pick one and do go along with it, certainly you will soon realize that you are doing Vipassana as well. So I think the question also comes from the Vipassana movement that came in the late 60s, I think. Uh, to United States and it was being popularized by Burmese and uh, Vipassana teachers. And if you sit in their practices uh, in retreat centers, you realize that you are doing both, Samadha and Vipassana. But it's okay. You know, terminology uh, is, an, is a key for you to enter, but with your right understanding, you will see that the Buddha did not want to just teach Vipassana or just teach Samatha. He wanted people to reach enlightenment through Bhavana. Chittam Bhaveti, cultivate the mind. That's what the Buddha highlighted. Any more questions? Okay, disappearing situation means enlightenment. Does this mean Uchedavada and enlightenment and Nibbana are equal or different? So enlightenment and Nibbana are uh, equal, but disappearance is not Uchedavada. Why? The Uchedavada is, you know, let me say is nihilism, a nihilistic view. Uh, you know, somebody would say emptiness also uh, is, you know, you come, you cultivate the mind and you reach to enlightenment and you are no more, like reaching nothingness. But these have been refuted by the Buddha. Even Uchedavada is an extreme. Uchedavada is basically, let me tell what Uchedavada really meant at the time of the Buddha. It meant that you don't continue being born again and again. You think that, right, it's like Vibhava Tanha. Vibhava, no Bhava. That after, the, after this birth, nothing happens. When you die, nothing happens. So you enjoy this life as much as possible. That's a view that the Buddha refuted. The Buddha saw that continuation happens. You'll be born in different places accordingly, according to your karma, according to your dispositions. Now, 
This question comes because you think that disappearance is reached into nothingness. Uh, in Buddhist, in Buddha's talks, if you talk about Chula Sunyata Sutta, Chula Sunyata, uh, discourse on uh, uh, emptiness, this small discourse on uh, emptiness, there the Buddha talks about um, this disappearance and he takes an example. It's like this whole United States disappears and comes to one state, just to Michigan. From that, you come to Southfield, where I am staying. From that, you come to the Great Lakes Buddhist Vihara. From that, you come to the Kuti, where I am staying. From that, you come to the place where I am standing. You have eliminated a lot to come to that place. That's the kind of emptiness the Buddha talks about. You stay focused on loving kindness, but everything else disappears. So because of that, you can always say that the continuation uh, is still there, like I mentioned earlier, even after reaching enlightenment, uh, you as a person may con you know, definitely continue to live. Therefore, you have not become nothingness. But up upon your passing away, like Parinibbana, there the, that continuation ends. It's not a view, it's a controlled, uh, very much like a training that brings you to that state of um, Nibbana. So that disappearance should not be mistaken with uh, Uchedavada at all. I hope that helps you. So what shall we do to gain enlightenment? So what shall we do? What shall we not do, right? So it's an interesting question. You have five precepts. You do five precepts for lifetime. That is because uh, enlightenment matters to you and that you see peace comes when you are within the framework of the five precepts. Starting from Sila, you cultivate Samadhi, the Jhana states, and you, along with that, cultivate wisdom, the Panya, the wisdom states. That's all you do. Basically, cultivating the mind, developing the mind, seeking spirituality, uh, finding spiritual joy, giving freedom to this body, stopping for stopping looking for craving instead leaving the cravings behind this is what you need to do to reach enlightenment okay i think we've come to the end of uh, today's uh Amma sharing okay. uh, those are all the questions that we had and i think we had a very good uh, number of uh, in the audience as well then uh, Considering today is Mother's Day, one day, and uh, in Malaysia, Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Yeah, and it's dinner time, and I think there's a lot of family time going on as well. Yeah. So we had a good number of people who were actually uh, with us live. So uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you, Bante, for your time. I know you're really busy because today is a full schedule for you at your Vihara, at the uh, Great Lakes uh, Vihara. And uh, just before we end, uh, I would like to make uh, this message to our listeners. Uh, we have a few more talks lined up for us uh, Im immediately. Uh, on Friday the 15th, uh, Bhante Premaratana, S. Premaratana will be with us again. Uh, he will be talking on mindfulness and right mindfulness. And on Sunday, uh, on May 17th, uh, Bhante Kusala will come back to again with us. And he will he'll be talking about finding inner peace uh, in crisis moments. And on Friday the 22nd, uh, Bhante Kondanya from New York will talk to us on free will in Buddhism. Now, all these talks will be at 8.30 p.m. Uh, there will be other talks that we have actually planned for the end of uh, May and running into June. Uh, so just to keep you informed, uh, just uh, look at our Facebook page for the postings and uh, just take a note that we have most times having it on a Friday or a Sunday night at most times, yeah? So with that, we've come to the end of today's sharing. Uh, Bante, 
thank you so much once again. Uh, would you like to just share the marriage with the devas and also for the daily departed Pante? Sure, just a second. Okay. I will do it uh, in English. Maybe you can do it in Pali, it's okay, no problem. Okay. Okay. Akasatha Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantanganu Moditwa Chiram Rakhantu Sasanang Chiram Rakhantu Desanang Chiram Rakhantu Twang Sada. So thank you everyone. We have come to the end and uh, may you have a pleasant evening for those of you in Malaysia and may you have a pleasant day in uh, Michigan, uh, in Detroit, and a very happy Vesak to one and all. Thank you for having me. Welcome.